you cannot refer to him without using the word. <laughs> he did that on purpose. Welcome to Tony's Backstage Pass. This is a behind the scenes of the music industry where Tony strips back the curtain and shows you what really goes on. So tune in and tune up. It's going to be a wild ride. Welcome to Tony's Backstage Pass. On this episode, we have two guests for you that you normally don't see, but hear. Our first guest is the number one DJ on the Gulf Coast. His wit is as well-timed as his drumming. I give you Kevin McKay. Hey, say hi to the film crew. Hey, film crew. Oh, wow, look at that. Tony's Backstage Pass, and we did a little something at Fockers earlier, and uh, I, I miss some, that. What do you call these, B-shots? I'm learning the lingo. We're getting a little B-shot. We're gonna play birthday, alive or dead, Glenn Fry. Dead. Really? I don't know. You're right. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. What band? Oh, Kevin, oh, I hate this game. You guys all know, right? Glenn Fry, no one. Listen, Anyone? ask me about Spice Girls again. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Glenn Fry. He would be Eagle Spice. He was an Eagle. <laughs> Shit, nah, 99 Rock. How about we go 90s Nugget? Girl Power Breeders Cannonball. So, Kevin. Yes. Thank you for coming and meeting us here at Fockers. Thank you. I love Walt. it. Look at this. I know. They, they're known for their pizzas. Yes. I haven't tried it, so I'm looking forward to it in Fort Walton, Florida. Yeah, right, here. right downtown Fort Walton. It's right by the bridge where... They're doing a bunch of construction. It's going to take about seven years, and then we'll finally be done. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for meeting me today. You're the number one rock DJ on the Gulf Coast, oh, right? Am I? You are. Okay. You are the man. <laughs> Everybody listens to you. Everyone knows your voice. Yeah. And, and Here's my money. Hang on. <laughs> and what's funny is, like, when we go out and everything, you're so tall. You know, people also recognize you. As well, I was telling a friend of mine, I'm like, I, I've never been the short friend before. And I go out with Kevin, everyone's like, move aside, Tony. I feel, I feel terrible because wherever I stand in a concert, there's this cone of no one behind me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm so <laughs> but hey, at least you don't, have, you know, you get to see. Yeah. You always have the best view no matter where you're at. But uh, we've been friends for a while, mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to talk to you for a long time, you know, being a DJ and us being in the music industry and everything, and you being on 99 Rock, you know, here in, in Florida. I wanted to talk to you a little about the business of being a DJ and the business of radio and right. how you got into it. What made you want to be a DJ? Oh, that's easy. Um, my dad's a chemical engineer, and growing up, you know, we were going on tours of colleges, and he's like, how's the engineering school? And I'm going... I don't know what he's talking about. I don't want to do that. And then they brought us through the TV radio section. I saw these four long hairs around a microphone and it just, it hit me. I'm like that, I want to do that. And they're like, no, you're not going to do that. And so that went back and forth. But I got my communications degree at Eastern Illinois in okay. radio and then had to get out there and get a job. Uh, so let me, so let me ask you when you were starting out, um, you know, there was that golden age, you know, remember like oh, we all grew up, you know, like beautiful. the name, the DJ yes. came from like the 1930s, but then from like the fifties to like the seventies, what people don't realize is that the DJ was really a lot responsible for a lot of music. We and bands oh, success. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, DJs were the guys that would say, Hey, you need to hear this. And right. they put on the airwaves and all of a sudden now that band is, you oh, know, yeah. famous. We're, the, we're the salesmen. Yeah. I mean, that's, we're selling them. But it became a problem. There were some that got paid to put things on. Oh, really? And then they started doing payola and plugola being illegal. You know, yeah. I would love to take money from you to put your money, your stuff on the air, but it's illegal. So. Well, and then the '80s kind of came in, didn't they? Kind of the corporations kind of coming. Oh, it got kind of corporate. Absolutely. And, yeah. 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 And how did that change what what you do? 
When you go into it, I know you have this corporate structure of, you know, they right. got to make money. They had to sell their advertising. Yeah. But then there's the music side, you know, in the band. It is very corporate. I work for the second biggest company. My views aren't of the company, I'll say, but ours is still pretty good in keeping it live and local. That's what they want. And really? music, of course, they do a lot of research, a lot of testing, working with artists. And we're kind of told what, what to play. You know, uh, there's a little bit of leeway there, but we're okay, kind of so it's not a hundred percent. So you're not 100%. just some guy sitting there and just pushing buttons. No, but so. make him think it's real complicated. <laughs> oh, he's done so much. <laughs> we're kind of told what what to play. There are certain, you know, here's new, and we're gonna hit this. We're gonna hit this hard. Um, so it's not like '70s and maybe part of the 80s radio, which I love, which was just crazy, just no, no. It's like the Wild West. In the Wild way. West. Bands would walk in studio. I have a friend that's older and he would tell me Aerosmith would just be in town and walk in studio, bring in the beer and other things yeah, and just yeah. lay it out in the studio <laughs> and like, we're here, you know. So it's, it's, it's more structured than that, but I still love what I do. And my part, being on the air, being a personality is what it's all about to me. What differentiates, what do you do to make yourself stand out though? Because I'm sure there's a ton of competition. Everyone, you know, is it's, on the radio. I love the personality aspect. I want to get out there and talk and shake it up, maybe get complaints or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And nowadays there's so much of what's called voice tracking. Like if I were to go in and just pre-record and put it in for later in the day, which takes out all the human element to me. Right. You know, you can have a tornado coming through town and this guy's on air going, here's Led Zeppelin, have a great day. You gotta keep it live. I love, I mean, my biggest thing is talking to listeners, Yeah. you know, which yeah. is harder to get to call in because now they text, they message on social media and it's hard to get them to call the request line, but you got to keep fishing for it, you know? And that's that's what I love about it. And I don't see a whole lot of that going on. Yeah, it seems to be fading a little because mm -hmm. I remember growing up, now we're both, you know, we're from the Midwest, so Jonathan Brandmeyer. Oh, it, Chicago uh, Radio. Right? That's what did the it, loop. that's what did it. Yeah, the Loop FM yeah. and XRT. And, and so for me as a musician, radio was, you know, the pinnacle. Right. Because right. that's where we wanted to be as musicians. One day I'm in my, my music on the radio yeah. and, and those guys, you wanted to get to know them because they were the conduit yes. to get my music. That was you wanted to radio. be the musician. I wanted to be the, the, the DJ, guy. the guy on the, but see, that's even what... AM radio in Chicago was huge. Yeah. You know, Kevin Matthews, we had yeah. AM stations that were huge. Oh, Kevin Matthews. Now with the voices mm -hmm. and everything, like yeah. when you listen to Kevin Matthews, that was a show. He put on a show. Oh, it yeah. wasn't, the music was almost secondary to oh, some guys. Absolutely. And, and I would say you're more like that. I in a way. The music's fun and yes. it's cool to keep yeah. rocking, but yeah, it's it's more about what am I gonna do next? What can I do? You know. Yeah, and when you prank call people, I mean it, I mean no one's doing that. I think no that's one. that's hilarious. And that's why you wanna listen, I guess. Yeah. You know, oh wait, Kevin's on. He's on the afternoons. Okay, there I gotta listen to Kevin. And some that hate me don't wanna listen because of that. But that's what you want. You don't wanna be lukewarm. No, no, and no, no. I love that that was that kind of 70s, 80s radio, mm -hmm. and it kind of faded. It got into the shock radio a little bit in the 90s. And Man that's, cow and Yeah, that and Stern, kind of and that's Stern, kind of yeah. faded a little. Now it's more corporate, more voice tracking, pre-recorded. So the best compliment I got was a band came in town, and he goes, dude, you're like the 80s DJs. He goes, don't take that the wrong way. And I'm like, I don't. I love that. That's a compliment. Well, and I don't hear a lot of radio DJs bringing artists in the studio, but you do. Like I try. John, John Five, and you have these relationships yes. with a lot of these guys yeah. out there, a lot of the bands, a lot of the musicians yeah. out there. Now, is that 99 Rock saying, Kevin, get out there no. and do it? Or is that Kevin no, going, no. I'm I doing it? I just said, I'm doing it. Ask for forgiveness rather than permission, yeah. you know? So um, yeah. absolutely, you just have to jump on it. And so many are happy to do it, but they're like, I just never get asked. Really? Yeah. So you got all these bands coming in and out of town and no one's reaching out to them. I'm sure some are, but they, from what I've heard, not, not as much as they would like. Yeah. But they're not, they're not making those connections like you are. I'm you trying. Know? I'm trying. You, you know, now I'm sure now this leads us, you know, you go to a lot of the shows. Yeah. Asked all the time and 99 oh, Rock yeah. sponsors certain shows and stuff like that. So you're, you're within that. You have access to all right, that. Right. So who, 
I'm sure you have, you know, this is the backstage pass. So I'm sure you've been backstage many times. Mm -hmm. Give us a backstage story. What's just something that's th that pops in your head. Um, who was uh, Vinny Paul's band? Was it Damage Plan? Or After Pantera? What? Hell yeah. There was a band oh, called Hell, Hell yeah. 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 Um, so usually they welcome you with open arms. We're radio. We're promoting you. Not there. And he has a pass. I understand why they're protecting him. Yeah. But yeah. I went backstage, had my station credentials, and the guy said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm with the radio station. We're promoting your show. And he goes, I don't care. Get out. Really? Went, All right. That was a fun backstage. Yeah. <laughs> Just that. But way. I understand. Yeah, I yeah, totally yeah. understand. And sometimes I, you don't want to meet your heroes sometimes because yeah. unfortunately, bad day or, or not, they're not what you thought they would be. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember the, the one concert we went to um, just recently, we were backstage and we went to go back to, I went to see George Lynch and he wasn't having Oh, it. he was not. He was not having He's an it. odd guy. I'll tell that to his face, but he knows it. <laughs> yeah. 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 He wasn't having it that no night. No eye contact, nothing. No. They even brought me back after the show yeah. and he, he wouldn't even talk. He wouldn't even look at me. It was so weird. I'm like, he was right, intimidated. See you later. You know, I'll squat down next here. time. <laughs> More I can yeah. just intimidate. Hi. <laughs> what people don't realize, some of that backstage, yeah. sometimes you don't want to meet your hero. Sometimes right. they're not nice people. Mm. Or they're just having a bad day. Yeah. I remember I did this thing in Las Vegas years ago, this rock and roll fantasy camp thing. And I remember um, Roger Daltrey was coming. I was like, I'd like to meet Roger Daltrey. That would be kind of cool to meet mm -hmm. Roger Daltrey. So he comes in. And they have this little reception area, you know, where we're all standing. He was not having it. He really? was cranky, oh, old man, don't English tell me man. That. Don't and tell he me that. walked in and he wasn't nice to anybody. Oh, that's terrible. But he just came from England. So yeah. then you got to give him a pass right, sometimes. Right, right, right. Sometimes you got to be like, okay, I understand. Yeah. This guy just flew 14 it hours could be a or bad whatever. Day. Yeah. yeah, so let's just let it go, you know? Yeah. Then the next day he came in, he's, that, he's got that English. Very but salty. He was better. Oh, he was better. He was better. Yeah, okay. but not much. You could oh. just tell he's never really the jovial, happy yeah, guy. Right. He's that guy. Yeah. Which I've heard about uh, <laughs> Roger Waters of Pink Floyd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's notorious for right, that. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, not a nice guy. Yeah. You got to realize I'm meeting someone who this is their only impression of you. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Like, honestly, Brett Michaels, love him or hate him, was the coolest guy. Took all the time to talk, He's to hang been. out. I would love to hear a negative meet and greet with Brent Michaels. I have never heard anybody no. who has ever met him say anything negative. He's cool. The people around the band a lot of the time are the ones who are the bad cop and they're like, all right, yeah. get out. Yeah, yeah. So he doesn't have to do it. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. he's great. And, and I, you know, I know the Poison guys, and Cece's one of my yeah. favorite people in the world. And he's, a real quick amazing. one, uh, the Pretty Reckless, Taylor Momsen. Yeah. Okay backstage and she they were the coolest really she's got her knee wrapped up and i said what's that she goes i get on stage the adrenaline i always do a power slide i know i'm gonna do it tonight i don't want to and then she said what do you drink i go i really don't drink and she goes well let's get you something i said vodka cranberry we don't have any hey go get kevin a bottle of vodka i'm like no <laughs> It's cool. I don't need that. I, yeah, I'm fine. Not I'm a whole fine. bottle. I'm fine. The juice box is fine. Yeah. <laughs> Stop whitening your smile the old-fashioned way with strips and trays that can take 30 minutes to an hour. I'm Jonathan Greenhut, the CEO of Paraswabs. When I met Dr. Ginnaker and he introduced me to Paraswabs and I saw how effective they were and how easy they were to use, I knew we had to share it with the world. Power Swabs was clinically studied to whiten natural teeth as well as stained caps, crowns, and veneers. It's so effective, it works on stains caused by coffee, tea, red wine, and even smoking. For those of you who have that one stained tooth, Power Swabs can target that area using swab precision. I was actually able to take the swab and really get through some of those areas that are kind of like untreated. I can immediately see the shades getting brighter and brighter or whiter and whiter. Order Power Swabs and receive up to 50% off the retail price. And as an added bonus, get a free quick stick pen with your order. Dial the number on your screen today. So let me ask you this, and I am, I gotta look at my phone real quick. Ah, uh, notes. Well, because I had a listener 
send in some questions. All right. Okay. Male or female? Female for the first one. Okay. So this is a, not my question. Okay. This is a listener question. Okay. Asking who at 99 Rock is sleeping with somebody from Candlebox. Oh. <laughs> because you play that song constantly. Not as much lately. <laughs> Not as much like. Do you know who, who? I know who that would be. And I think she made this awesome pottery here. She hates Candlebox. <laughs> she does. I will watch that. I so will she's watch like, that. you got to ask Kevin. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they, corporate, they have their research. That was they, on the list. They huh? do their thing. They research men, female demographics, and that shows up as a song really? that people besides her like. Or is the royalties really cheap or something? Maybe, and, you know. You know, and they're a polarizing band. Some love them, some hate them. Yeah. And, well, and I, yeah. We know someone. I don't like think them. that's a bad place to be in. Right. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Let's say that somebody's coming up. They have a band. Their perception is, I want to get like me as a kid. I want to get my music on the radio. I'm sure you get this a lot, demo a tapes lot. and stuff. How does that process work? Tell them how that works. Get, what I love is out. at a show, here's my here's my CD or here's my, yeah. you know, I'll email you an MP3, put me on the air. Like all of a sudden between Van Halen and Led Zeppelin, I'm putting right, yeah, exactly. Joe's local band. Uh, you know, there are some stations that do a local Sunday night show, maybe two hours of local. We don't do that. Um, other stations do. I just tell them, look, you, you got to get to this level where corporate says, we want to add you to our rock stations. We like it. And I'll give them all the names, but it goes up the chain. I have a program director, and if he likes someone, we threw on a band called Gunshine out of Pensacola. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Started putting them in regular rotation because he liked them. Had a little freedom to do that. Send it up to corporate. Do you guys want to use this? They on shot the video. All the stations. You shot the video for. Give it up. Put the cameras on them. Yeah. They did wow. the video. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. But see, and, that's nice. see and how do you say Orin? Orin Thai? Or All right. These are my new best friends right yeah. here. <laughs> um, but then you send it up the chain. Do you like this? Do you want to add mm -hmm. it to Rock? Speaking of Candlebox, they came in studio and did a great or horrible, depending on if you like them, version acoustic of Far Behind. Yeah. I sent it to corporate. They put it on all of our stations. Oh. Because they I played like that Shaker Egg on it. Yeah. Oh, nice. But it, it's always up the chain. So you and get royalties for that now. It right? trickles down. No royalties at all. <laughs> it trickles down from there. Yeah, if they yeah. like it, stations start playing it. Okay. So my advice, in, in local bands now, you can go on YouTube and get hired by Journey. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. amazing. You don't have to move to Seattle, L.A., New York. You don't have to. That's neat. Okay, yeah. And that's what it's good to know because some people, that all they see is, well, I just want to be on that. And yeah. I remember being a kid listening to Rena yeah. go, well, I just want to be on there. Right. And, but have no idea how to do it. Whatsoever. And I will throw someone local on and just say, listeners, call in. Yeah. But then you got to have tough skin because some call in saying that sucked. Yeah, Don't ever play terrible. Again. Yeah. Well, that's like the music business. Yeah. Anyway, you yeah. got to have thick skin. You have to. Yeah. yeah. So well, I, I figured there had to be a core because, you know, to this day, I'm still racking my brain how the Macarena got on the radio. That Love had to have been some corporate payout. Should be on more. That, that didn't test on anybody. <laughs> no, nobody tested. It tested with soccer this. moms through the roof. It had to have been. I mean, my God, that was the worst. I remember that come on, I'd be like, off. Oh, I'll tell you something. I have no problem with Hanson Mbop. That no. is a good pop song. Yeah, and those three girls are great. They are. I'm so <laughs> proud of my daughters. <laughs> no, they're really, but that's the other thing. Some, you may not like it, but you could see that, you know, yeah. the talent. Or right, whatever. right, But right. some things, it's just like, how did this get? Oh, I agree. I mean, you got to see some stuff going My hatred on. of uh, Sugar Ray is an example. I just can't stand them. And you think of great bands that never... Like that would be a whole show or podcast is great songs that no one's ever heard, you know, by yeah. bands that no one's ever heard. Well, and you have, and there's a few of these bands, like for me personally, and I'm, I'll date myself, go back a little bit. For one, for whatever reason, Tesla is one yeah. of those bands that always seem to kind of go under the Underrated. radar. Underrated. They did the one cover and that's the one you hear all the time, right. but their own music right. was fantastic. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. they had right. a bunch of great songs. Tons of great songs. Right. And they're still going. And yeah. uh, I think that was our last concert before COVID. Did you go with us? Yeah. To, yeah, yeah Sanger yeah. Theater yeah. at Pensacola. Right yeah. then COVID hit. Tesla started COVID. <laughs> 
Oh, no, let's not start no, that No, rumor. no, no, let's no. Let's not start that rumor. They'll I, be like, I oh, did, God. I don't know. <laughs> Neil Pert died and the world went. Then COVID that, hit and the world it. went. Well, so I see, blame it on Neil Pert it dying. It is. It is. That's, that's a shame. That's a shame about Neil. But now there is this rumor. And let's talk a little bit about it because I'm sure you get a lot of this, too. They're talking about a rush reunion with maybe with the drummer from Tool. Right. Playing, I can't think of his name. Off Danny Carey. Danny Carey, yeah. Which I think, personally, I think that's a great... You think it's a great idea? I, 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 technically, I think he could do it. Oh, he could do it. You know and there I mean? was talk of, I think, Dream Theater's Mike Portnoy could do it. I, th I think he's good. I think there's a lot of drummers that could do it, but hmm, I got to wonder if I would like that reunion. You know. I would go see it. I would go see it. You're a drummer, so we'll talk a little. We'll talk. By drums. the way, Alex Lifeson has arthritis. He doesn't know if he can do all that now. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, Old man. people talk. I know, right? He and he's amazing. They're amazing, anyway. Hanson's I mean. still doing amazing. <laughs> They're still great. But now the Van Halen tour that's going to be coming out with Satriani and they and right. they got Jason Bonham on drums. Right. That I think is a miss. Jason Bonham. Alex is not. No, Alex Van Halen's oh. not doing it. But there, to me, Mike Portnoy would be a better drummer to play Van Halen than than Jason Bonham, in my okay. opinion. I don't yeah, think he has he has the Van Halen. Alex, what thing. people don't realize is what a great drummer he was. Alex Van Halen was a, yeah, is an amazing drummer. You, you think of Eddie, maybe David Lee Roth, but Alex is one of my favorite drummers. Yeah, because he was sitting in the back. People didn't and the pay stuff his, he does is it's it's crazy. Very complex. Right. Yeah. It's and very Bonham syncopated. Is, he's more of a power straight yes. drummer. Yeah, yeah. 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 I can see that. So but to that's, me, that's, that's half Halen. I don't even like that idea. No. 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 So, but they're gonna go out, and I know people are giving Joe Satriani, you know, yes. a lot of a lot of sh about well, just like doing the Eddie thing. Pantera. But, and I saw them with Zach. Zach Wilde, and then Charlie Benante of Anthrax yeah. on drum. It and was that, great. That it was makes great. sense to me. It was though, great. Because, you know, going back, I mean, I, I had the, I, not to brag or tell an old story, but when I was at Washburn years ago, right. you know, I worked with Dime and I got to hang out with Dime and Zach. Mm -hmm. That was a friendship of those two guys. And what a great guy. Yeah. yeah. And and I know people are like, oh, Zach's the, the fill-in guy. He filled in for Randy Rose oh, for, yeah. for Ozzy. Right, and then right, he, right. But I think Zach is just that good. Now, this is a rumor. There's another question from 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 you know your listeners. A listener. Tell us the story when you turned down the lead singer position for Van Halen. When you when Eddie asked you to sing for Van I Halen. I think he had a few drinks, and uh, I was at a karaoke in L.A. And people said that Eddie was there, and he said, "Do you want to come try out to be my next singer?" That's fantastic. It but, is. but you were like. I got the DJ gig. I said, you know, I can't Eddie, be on I don't road. think you're big enough. And I just, that, maybe right. if you make it someday, maybe I'll stop right <laughs> You got then. some talent, kid, yeah. but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, what I always tell people like Eddie, people are like, well, did Eddie really have that, any kind of impact? Right. And I said, well, Eddie's like, like, like Hendrix to me. Look, you have to, you can't look so much at what they did. You have to look at what came after them. Ah. You know what I mean? When Hendrix played a Stratocaster, then you have Clapton, Jeff Beck, everybody played Strats after that. So it was his influence. It changed all what yes. came after. Yes. Eddie put a humbucker in a Stratocaster and did the win. And Mad then all scientist. of a sudden, all of 80s, I mean, you'd be Started hard to find a guitar player yeah. in the 80s that had a humbucker in a Strat with a whammy that is bar. Amazing. I mean, so, yes, his impact was, and everybody tried to sound like Eddie yeah. and tried to tap like Eddie. So, even they're, Alex, they're innovators. innovator too. Alex, I think. Yeah. Alex oh, was. on drums. Yeah. And there is a story. I don't know it completely, but something about he was going deaf for monitors, and his tech built something I believe out of a pacemaker that had some kind of speaker, and that was starting the in-ear monitor. No kidding. Something about a pacemaker. Not that pacemakers have speakers, but yeah. there was some weird story that he built him. The first in-air oh, monitor. because he was he was going deaf from a monitor, just just blaring. Yeah, at him. I yeah, can see that. Yeah. I can see. Yeah, because those things, you know. But you oh, also yeah. got to watch with those in-ears too, because now that's the sound right in your ear. Yeah. So you kind of got to. Either watch way, you're going deaf. Yeah. I know. I just why I Either wear the way. plugs now. Yeah, you know, yeah, to yeah. go to see, even go to watch a concert, yeah. I got to put in <laughs> oh, the, yeah. the ear plugs. Oh, so I've done that for years. I see like kids, and I'm like, I don't want to be the old guy, but wear earplugs. And they're like, no way, dude. You're cool. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> see ya. Well, Kevin, thank you. I think 
Anything I'm missing? We anything? Find, yeah, we're missing anything? the pizza. We, we got to eat. eat the pizza. Manja with the pizza. Thank you, Fockers, for having us Thank today. You, Thank you, Kevin. You know, thank you, 99 Rock. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Eat. Manja. You would hear bullets whizzing by, and we'd always say, well, the bullet that you don't hear, that's coming straight at you. So <laughs> thank God you heard the bullet go by. The worst thing is seeing the Humvees coming back, going to the morgue, bringing the pieces of the bodies from the group. That just killed me inside. And it was so hard to even look at. The nightmares were horrible for many, many months. They were unbearable, just sweating, just waking up screaming. Something would happen and I would just weep and go into a depressive state. information, please visit www.guitarsforvets.org. That's guitar with an S, the number four, vets.org. Our second guest is one of the most sought after guitar techs in the world. He's worked with Poison, Nine Inch Nails, Journey, and the king of rock guitar, Eddie Van Halen. This man is so well known in the industry, you can't refer to him without using the word the before his name. I give you the Tom Weber. You look exactly <laughs> the same. No, it's been a few years, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Quite a few, actually. Well, let's start off. I want, for, for a lot of the people watching, you know, the, the first question they're gonna ask is, well, what is a guitar tech? What does a guitar tech do? What, what's your day-to-day? -day? Fill us in on what, what you do being a guitar tech. Guitar tech is kind of like the, uh, it's, it's the, the, the head cook and bottle washer for all of things with strings on them. Um, it's, it's a job where you're responsible for musical instruments, um, string them, polish them, set them up, make sure they're absolutely consistent from one day to the next so that the artist doesn't have to look at you and go, why does my guitar not play the way that it did yesterday? It's an all day job. Uh, it's babysitting instruments and being there for your artist. You try really hard to listen, uh, pay attention. Um, you have to be on top of your game every minute of the day because at any point in time, Something can go south, and you're the guy that has to make it work. So, it's uh, it can be a handful, but uh, but I love it. I just I love it. Uh, it's a it's a long day, but you know it's not as bad as some. Right. You know I could be a, I could be a lighting guy or an audio guy or a video guy and a rig or a rigger. You know those guys have to get up way early in the morning, <laughs> and they stay up way late at night. You know. Uh, backline guys, you know, and, and for those who don't know what the, what the, the term backline guy is, um, a backline technician is uh, somebody that deals with the band's personal equipment. You know, we're the last ones in. You know, hopefully everybody has a good day and we can get a lot of time on the stage to do what we need to do. But you know, if if they're not, we have to make the time up, and, and we're the, also the first ones out, which is not a bad thing. You know, you, you work until you're done, and then you're and then you're done, and you don't have to come back later and, then you're and gone. take stuff out of the ceiling and all of that. So, well, now for yeah. for a lot of guys that may not know, and and this is what's always impressed me, um, s seeing the behind the scenes and how shows are put together. What a lot of guys may not understand is you're not just responsible maybe for one guy's one guitar. Uh, when guys are on tour, they could have up to how many guitars? 10, 12? I mean, depending on the show and how many changes. I mean, you are really the guy that has to maintain quite a bit of stuff. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, when I was on, on tour with Journey, there were now there were days where we'd have 48 guitars in the building and another 36 in, in, the, in the, the truck. And that's just Neil's stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, Matchbox 20, we were on tour with, uh, with uh, Counting Crows. And somewhere I have a, a photograph of, of stage right or stage left. Um, and between the, the, the three guitar techs that were over there, there were probably 150 guitars. And it's just insane, <laughs> just insane. You know, nine Inch Nails. There, there are there are songs where there's a, a different guitar used in a different part of a song. So you may have two, maybe three guitar changes during a song. One song. So, and yeah, and if you're smart, if you have a guitar that your artist likes to play, you have a very similar backup to that. So if something happens to it, you know what guitar you have to hand him right away. Um, broken strings, you know, there's any one of a number of things that can go south during a show and you're the guy that has to make sure that nobody notices if that's at all possible. So it's, it's kind of a, it can be a stressful situation if you let it. Now, I've, I've always told guys, you know, build it right in rehearsal and, and you won't be chasing it on the road. So, you know, build in as many redundant backups as you can to every single thing that can possibly go wrong and just know that you may have to rely on them at any moment and you'll be fine. Very cool. Well, let me ask you this. Now, now that we, you know, people know, okay, this guy's worked with Neil Sean, he's worked with these amazing people. How do you get into something like that? How did your journey start? I started as an audio guy um, back in the 70s. I've been on audio gigs with Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, Montrose, you know, Everything from King Sonny Ade and his 25-piece African drum band to Steve Morris. It was a lot of years as an audio guy. And uh, I took a break because I, my, uh, my son was born and I, I wanted to spend a little time watching him grow up. And uh, I literally turned down a gig with Deep Purple. Um, and, and I, you know, most people would go, are you nuts? But... <laughs> You, sometimes you have to set your priorities because one thing that we don't get um, in this industry is is time. I'm usually home. I was home 46 days last year, so family time is really, really precious. I took this break to to watch my son grow up. I opened my own car repair shop. Um, got it to where I thought I really wanted it to be, and I got a. Uh, I got a voicemail one day, a buddy of mine uh, who was the production manager for the band Blessed Union of Souls out of Cincinnati uh, was on my voicemail saying, you know, they were looking for a guitar tech and I wondered if I knew anybody that would be interested. And I thought to myself, you know, the whole time that I'd been an audio guy, I never gave one thought to being a backline tech. Uh, it never crossed my mind. I built my first guitar when I was 14 years old, you know but it just wasn't part of, I was an audio guy. And I thought, I bet I could do that. I mean, I can carve you a guitar with a cabinet scraper from you know, a tree stump if I have to. And, uh, and so I called him back. I said, you know, I got his voicemail, of course. And uh, I said, you know, give me the particulars. I might be interested. And he called me back about 20 minutes later. He said, dude, I never thought we'd get you. He said, it doesn't pay enough. He says, let me call the guitar player I'll make sure he's cool with it. You know, I'll call the record label. We'll see if we can get some, some more tour support and uh, I'll, we'll see what happens. And he called me back about two hours later. He said, dude, guitar player's ecstatic, record label's behind it, and I can afford to pay you money. And that's where I got my start as a guitar tech. And Money's good, yeah, that's from awesome. There, it was, you know, from there, it just kind of is the list that you, know, that you have. Yeah. You know, uh, there aren't a lot of names on that list, but oh that list is pretty impressive my friend it's an impressive list yes, but, you know but you got to be kind of scared of, of, a, of a long list of artists because if you have to work for a lot of different artists it means you haven't been back and oh. i'm really i'm really pleased to say that my list is pretty short um okay. for the, the amount of time i've been at it because it's i 
think that I've got a good situation going with the, the people that I work with. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's why you're the Tom Weber. That's why we put the the, the, the before it. Because we everybody loves you. Anybody who's ever met you, anybody that I know that knows you, all say the exact same thing. I mean, I, I had an interview with Josh, and Josh was like, well, who else you got coming? I said, well, I got Tom. Oh, the Tom Weber. He goes, oh my God, that's great. He goes, tell him I said hello. You know, you're that guy. You've always been that guy. Yeah, Josh is great. He's, he's I, I had occasion to do some, I, w I was on tour with Bush last year, and uh, uh, working with Chris Trainer, and we, did some work with Josh with the, the Sheptone pickups, and he wound a few things for us that were really, really everything that I could ask for. I know, I love them too. I, I, I got them in my guitars. Yeah, we've got, uh, uh, Chris came out with a, a 63 SG Junior last mm. year. Uh, wanted to play slide on it for one song. He's a Les Paul guy, so I was ready to hand him his main guitar back, and he kind of waved it off, he said, no, I'll keep this, and. Uh, and uh, the next song was a heavier song and he started playing and he turned and looked at me with his mouth hanging open and his eyes wide open and i'm looking at him the same way it's like oh my god listen to that it was the single best sounding guitar i've ever heard in my life so of course the you know the next day we're looking all over god's green creation to try and reproduce this so that we have more than one of them yeah. And Josh did a really great job. You know, he wound a pickup for this thing, a, a P90, uh, that it sounded so close to the first one that it's like, okay, we can hand these back and forth and not worry about, well, this one sounds completely different and I miss, I miss the great one and this one's just a standby, you know? Yeah. And that brings up a really good question. The artists themselves, how involved are you with, with their setup and with their rigs? Do you help them get their, their, you know, their rigs together? Do they ask you for suggestions? I mean, how's a lot of that come about? It, it varies from artist to artist. I, when I started with Neil, it was don't touch anything. It's temperamental enough. You just to string guitars, don't touch anything. Well, we had a failure about four minutes before showtime that basically we unveiled a serious problem and I got around it and I mean it's showtime walk back for after fixing the issue uh, temporarily hand him a guitar and say have a good show and he didn't even he didn't even ask what was wrong uh, until the next day and and I had to tell him what was going on I said look you know it's my job to make sure that you have a an enjoyable environment in which to do what you do, but it's my responsibility to make sure that you're safe. So I have to be allowed to go through and fix things that are not right. And I told him that he, we ran across something that was potentially really dangerous. I had to convince him that, look, you gotta, you gotta turn me loose a little bit, you know, so that I can find stuff. And I. I said, look, I know that you're worried that something will change. We'll change things one thing at a time. When I find something, I'll tell you what I found, and we'll change that. You try it. Tell me if it's better or if it's not. If there's a way to keep it the way that it is without it being dangerous, then fine. We'll go from there. And yeah. every day for most of the tour, it was like, holy crap, it sounds so much better. And it's never sounded like this. And we just had a ball. Want more Backstage Stories? Become a member of our Patreon page. You'll get access to bonus footage, full performances, swag, and special live events where you can interact with guests. This is your Backstage Pass. Well, that brings me to our buddy. Speaking of backline rigs, and you know where I'm going, our buddy Cece with his backline rig and that's actually how we met we got to you got to tell that story how what happened and then that's actually how we met years ago uh was with poison when you were out with cc deville yeah cc is cc's my favorite cartoon character i i i love him to death uh, we have such a good time touring when you and i met uh, that whole situation was one of the coolest things ever. We were in, in Mississippi someplace rehearsing, I believe. Yeah. And uh, 
there's all kinds of stuff from PV in every dressing room. Uh, guitars and you know, practice amplifiers and it's like you know a little note that says you know just stopped in to say hi check this out you know and, and if you need anything let me know and I thought wow that is the coolest thing in the world and first day of rehearsal we walk in and Bobby Dahl's tech goes to turn on his, his rack full of, of amplifiers and the whole thing starts huffing smoke and I don't I don't know to this day we don't know what happened to it but all of them went at the same time. Yeah. It's almost like it's almost like they were hooked up to the wrong power. And I had just met you, and mm-hmm. I'm frantically making phone calls trying to get that situation straightened out. And you're on the phone, and within, I mean, same day courier service and local music store and this, that, and the other thing. All of a sudden, we had gear uh, because you knew where to go to get it and how to get it there in a hurry and holy crap it was like this guy is amazing i don't believe (laughs) this and you know it's it's really great for us to find people like you because you are one of me you're one of maybe three people that i've met in my whole tenure as a guitar tech that understands what artist relations actually is it's well who are the other two because i'll kill them and then i can be the only one <laughs> no i'm kidding <laughs> there you go there you go you know i'm italian so you know there you go <laughs> yeah, well yeah it's it's, it's just a, it's a very very personal job yeah and yeah it is you just did a, you just did an amazing job with it oh, we man. still talk about you we talk about you wonder where you are what you're doing yeah People need to understand, you, you become like a family. You know what I mean? It's not just, it, it is a job and you, you do expect to get paid, but when you're dealing with these people and they're traveling, they're away from home and this and that, the people you're with every day, you know, you do create a little bit of a bond. And, and the one thing I, I can say out of all the bands that I've worked with, you know, when I was at PV or Washburn or wherever, you know, you, you have your favorites. You know what I mean? You and I hit it off right out of the gate. So. You know, we we always got along. So and then but then when you come into the poison thing and this is what I want people to know about these professional bands and when they're touring and stuff, it's it's really kind of an amazing thing when you're brought into their world and they make you feel like family. I mean, um, you know, and Brett and Cece and, and, and you and JP and all the guys, I mean, from day one, when I came in, I felt like, wow, these are my people. I, I, li- I, I love this. This is really cool. There's a reason why they're so successful and still around. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's a pleasure to work with people like that. It's so much fun. Most of the artists that I have worked with, there has been a bond like that. I have to tell you this funny story. Brett was doing, out doing his solo thing, and he was playing the fair down in Pensacola here, right? This was a year or two ago. And, um, and I was on the side of the stage, haven't seen him or anything, you know, Brett's Brett, you know, doing his thing. And I'm standing on the side of the stage. He goes to walk like I just saw him an hour earlier. Hey, Tony Pasco, how you doing? Comes up to me, hugs me. Like, and, awesome. yeah, he, and my wife is standing there and he goes, who's this beautiful lady? You know how, you know how he is. And, and she's like, you really do know Brett Michaels. I'm like, I told you, you know, but I didn't think in a million years that he would remember because it's been a few years, you know, so people move on and he meets so many people. But he, at that moment, he acted like there was nobody else in this huge arena where he was playing. And he has, and that's a, a wonderful ability he does have. He makes you feel yeah. like you're the only one there. Like you have all his attention at that moment. And it, it's, it, it was really sweet. And that's where it made me feel like, wow, I, I had an impact with these people. We did have a connection, you know what I mean? And it's, and it's a Absolutely. nice thing. Well, and, and that's one of the, the great things about that family. You know, we may be kind of, we may be kind of dysfunctional, but you know, it, it is a family. It's once you are a part of the Poison family, you, you never, you're, you're never not a part of the Poison family. Right. You can be the black sheep and nobody will talk to you for a couple of months or, or something, but you're still, it, it's, it's in your heart and, and you don't know why you go back, but you do because you have to, you know, it, yeah. it, there may be, there may be bigger tours to do, but I'll tell you what, if I have the opportunity to, to go and hang out with CC and the guys, 
I, I, I can't turn it down. I mean, until I'm, until I'm too old to do it or I'm just plain dead, that phone rings and it's CC on the other end of the phone. I'm showing up. So let me ask you this, why, and I know people will get upset at me if I don't at least ask, and I know better than to say who's your favorite that you work for, because they're all different. They're all great, they're all horrible at the same time, you know what I mean? But, you know, we, people are going to say, well, you didn't ask him how it was working for Eddie Van Halen. I mean, Eddie is Eddie. You know, at PV, I get that too, you know, the Eddie thing, you know, and, and oh, yeah. you had, of course, a lot more contact with Eddie than I did at PV, but... Um, the story I want to know, and I don't think I've ever asked you this, is how did you get the gig with Eddie? How did that come about? Well, I am, I have a wonderful relationship with a, with, with a fellow named Adam Reaver. Um, Adam used to work for Floyd Rose. He now has a company called Floyd, uh, Floyd Upgrades, uh, FU.com. Yeah. He's one of my favorite people. And we hit it. He, we hit it off exactly the same way that you and I hit it off. Right, right off the bat, it was like, oh hell, here we go. <laughs> Adam went to school with Matt Brook. You know Matt. Yeah. So, oh seven, oh eight, they had, they had been through several guitar techs before the tour ever left rehearsal, and it wasn't working out. Matt called Adam and said, I need somebody that that knows Floyd Rose's inside out. You're the guy that knows everybody that knows Floyd Rose. I've talked to people that, that either they're busy or they won't work for Ed because again, it's another one of those gigs where the, the rumor is it's, it's, it's a tough one. Um, people are, over, are afraid of that gig um, because it's Ed Van Halen, for Christ's sake. You know, yeah. how, do you, how do you wake up in the morning and have a normal life knowing that your day is, is working for arguably the greatest guitar player of our time yeah there's a there's a mindset that that gets in the way for some people with that but uh, uh when matt called adam adam said i could give you five numbers but i'm going to give you one because it's the only one you need and i'm he called me later it's like dude and i'm i'm nervous as i can possibly be right yeah. so i get the phone call to come out to california and and go to 5150 and interview for the position awesome off i go i on an airplane i get out there matt takes me to, to 5150 and and he hands me a guitar and he says you're you're to set this up the way that you think ed would like it and i'm to give you absolutely no information to go by wow all righty then yeah put yourself in that position yeah. <laughs> I took a step back and I thought to myself, if this was easy, I wouldn't be here. Right. So how hard can I possibly make this? And I thought, okay, as far outside the box as I can possibly think. I'd met Ed years before. I had occasion to shake hands with him and I got a chance to sit down and play guitar with him for several hours, which was an amazing thing. Yeah. Um, but I remember that he had a grip that told me that you know, you, you, when, the, when the string meets the fret, you get the note. When the string meets the fingerboard, you get a different note. So you're going to have to set the intonation for the, the idea that he's going to manhandle that guitar. You've got to set the intonation flat enough to compensate for the idea that we're pulling the note past the fret itself. Now, when you strike the string, it shows up sharp on the tuner, but, and then it settles into the, the, the note that it actually is. Ed Van Halen isn't going to stay in any one place long enough for a note to settle into pitch. So oh. the strike of the string has to be the note. And I'm also thinking to myself, he's also a classically trained pianist. So the strings being in tune with one another doesn't matter. He needs it to be in tune with itself in the position that he's in playing. In a fretted position. Right. Yeah. So okay. temper tuning for Ed is, is a serious part of it. You have to be able to grab a chord in the position and it has to be in tune with itself. Interesting. Basically, by taking all those things into consideration, by the time you temper tune each string in a position, and then I'd go back to the first position and split the difference between the, the two, 
by the time you finish that, the, the high E string or D sharp uh, because of the tuning, it's 14 cents flat. Now, oh. oh my, yeah, I see the look on your face. Yeah. 14 cents flat, oh my God. If I pick up one of Ed's guitars and I go to play it, I sound like a blithering idiot because I'm, I don't play that way. But I got, the, I got this thing finished and I thought, okay, if I've blown it, you know, I'm just glad that I got the call to be here. So I walk up, I hand the guitar back to Matt, and he says, you finished? I says, yeah. And he says, are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I'll take it up to the house. We'll hand it to Ed, see what he says. Make yourself at home. Yeah, make myself at home at 5150 Studios. I sat on my hands for 10 minutes. He's going to sit in the corner. I'm not touching anything. I want to. <laughs> yeah. About 10 minutes goes by, and Matt walks back in the, the door with a guitar over his shoulder. He says, dude, big smile right out of the box. He said, uh, I've been with Ed for 17 years. And he says, "Not nobody on this planet, not even I, can tune a guitar for him. And he puts the guitar down. He hands me another one in a, in a soft shell case. He said, Ed wants you to take this one back to your hotel and wave the magic wand over it. He wants to know if you're good or if you're lucky. Oh. He said, I'll... I'll pick you up tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock. We'll come back. It'll be here. We'll talk. So I brought the guitar back and, you know, get back to the hotel, set it up the, pretty much the same way. And uh, I had to compensate a little bit because there was different fret wire in that one. So it uh, needed to be a little different. And went back the next day and uh, Ed comes down. And of course, he, 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 he walks in the door and he, he looks at me, he goes, I know you. I said, yes, sir, you do. And he says, I don't remember why I know you, but I know you. And, uh, and we talk. He sees the, the guitar sitting on the workbench at the studio, and he goes, this the one that you worked on? And I said, yes, it is. And he picked it up and held it to his ear, and, and he strummed a chord, and he said, it's perfect. He said, where have you been all my life? Oh, I said, wow. On the other end of the phone, waiting for you to freaking call me. <laughs> You've had my telephone number since 1987. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it was really funny because they, they, they said, uh, he and Matt said at that point, said, you know, the guy that we were talking about replacing in the past 24 hours, he's really kind of stepped up his game. So, yeah. you know, we're not sure what we're going to do. I thought, oh, crap. You know, here we go. <laughs> yep. I said, no, okay, if, if I, I got the call. So we'll see what happens with this. And, and Ed says, you know, yeah, it's too bad you don't run sound. And I said, well... You know, if you, rem I don't, if, you, if you remember, when you and I met in 87, I was the house audio engineer at Harwood Amphitheater. I, said, I started out as an audio guy. And he said, could you run sound for Van Halen? I said, I could. And I'm thinking, i got to give him an honest answer. I don't want to. Yeah. You know, I said, I, I, yes, I could. I said, however, you know, when I went to uh, look at rehearsal uh, yesterday, I, I noticed that you it's all digital mixing consoles. I've been a guitar tech all the way through the, the, uh, the transition from analog to digital. I don't even know how to turn one of those things on. And quite frankly, I really don't care for the sound of them. And he goes, yeah, me either. And there's this pause and he goes, so what kind of console do you think you'd want? I said, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're going the wrong way here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I went back, uh, I flew back home uh, yeah. the next morning. I called Adam and I said, dude, you know, I don't think I'm going to get the gig. Whether because of discomfort, lack of mobility, your lifestyle, or occupation, you sit inactively way too many hours a day. Introducing Ellipse, the premium quality automatic seated exerciser that strengthens legs, increases mobility, and boosts circulation without physical strain or impact. It is so quiet that none of my coworkers even know I'm using it. Strengthen and tone your legs, increase your mobility, flexibility, and balance, plus stimulate healthy circulation. My joints feel 
better, my knees feel better, my back feels better. It makes me feel stronger too. Perfect for home therapy. Whisper quiet to use while you work. My circulation is moving, I'm burning calories, and it makes me feel energetic. Call now and order Ellipse, the seated exerciser that strengthens legs, increases mobility, and boosts circulation. Call and get upgraded to the deluxe bundle. Get the faster motor for five miles of steps per hour. The step counter, the sport mat, and wireless remote. Call now. I flew back home yeah. uh, the next morning, and uh, I, I called Adam and I said, dude, you know, they said the other guy has, has picked up his game. I don't think I'm going to get the gig. And he says, relax, you'll get the call. And two days later, they uh, they called and said, can you be in L.A. tomorrow morning? I said, I can be there anytime you want me to. And of course, I, I went to the shop, I packed up my work box, got it all, uh, on a truck, and off it went, because, like, okay, i got to have a work box. Right. And, and keep in mind, this is an 800-pound work box, right? And, uh, you know, I, I flew into LAX, and uh, Matt picked me up, and we went straight to the forum. And uh, where Van Halen had been rehearsing for a month at the forum. Full production rehearsal, full crew catering, everything for a month. I was like, wow, that's amazing. We're walking down the load-in ramp, and I, I, something just struck me. It's like I realized that I had just walked past my work box. They same day couriered my 800-pound work box from Cincinnati to L.A., and it Ooh. beat me there. Holy crap. What did that cost to get there? Uh, <laughs> from what I understand, $8,600. Oh! Yep. First day I'm there, Ed's rig runs on an un uninterrupted power supply, just in case the power goes off. Right. And I'm, I've always wondered, it's like, okay, if the power goes off, what's the sense of having the guitar rig? Because there won't be anything else, right? Yeah. I'm looking at this, this UPS, and it's a really good one. And the batteries are shot. The fan circuit isn't working properly. You know, it's going to need some repair work. And I thought, the only way that I'm going to get pull this off is I'm going to have to say, it needs to be fixed. It's going to cost this much, or we're we going to have to replace it, and it's going to cost this much. Right. Well, it was going to be about $3,500 to fix the, the, the one that they had, and it was going to be 13500 and something to replace it. So I went in the production office, and I, I said, okay, here's my problem. UPS is not functioning properly. Here's what it's going to cost to fix it. Here's what it's going to cost to replace it. And the, the, the production manager's got both sheets in, in his hands. He says, buy the new one, fix the old one, we'll use it as a spare. Okay, now well, I understand how this works. Only Whatever Ed wants right? to have, it's going to get. It's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to abuse this privilege, but at least I know where I stand. Yeah. And the funniest thing about that whole thing is we got to a point in the tour where we were playing a show and about four bars into the guitar solo, the power goes off in the building or the feed for the, for the stage power. PA's down, lights are down, the follow spots from the venue and Ed's guitar rig are the only things running. <laughs> and I mean, you can, you notice, you know that the, the, the when the PA goes away, it's just the guitar rig. Yeah. And I, I, I quit dove and turned volumes up on things. And yeah. he looked at me with this look like, what the hell happened? And I said, everything's dead. <laughs> Keep playing. <laughs> and he played until the PA came and the lights came back on. And if you didn't know it wasn't supposed to be that way, you wouldn't have been able to tell. Wow. And from that day on, it's like, okay, I get it. You want to play through a UPS? Any, anybody that plays through a UPS, fine. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm all for it because it saved my ass that day. The one thing that you have to take in, into consideration with Ed, the, the one word that he uses is consistency. It has to be consistent. And on a daily basis, you know, guitars are measured in thousands of inches for a reason. They don't work the same way if they're off by a few thousands of an inch. And someone like Ed is going to know that it's off by a few thousandths of an inch. So my game has to be, 
I have to I have to do my job in thousands of inches in order to maintain that level of comfort for any artist, um, and and especially somebody like that. He deserves it. You know, he he. Whereas somebody might let it go, um, Ed shouldn't have to. You know, nobody should have to. And I think that's that's the reason why I say you know. I learned to ask a question and shut up and listen to the answers. And if there, if it brings about another question that I can ask to get a clearer idea of what the artist is actually expecting of me, it's going to be that much better of a day tomorrow. And somebody's going to smile and go, you know, if it's the same way every day from that day forward, it's a better day than it was the day before. You don't go into the job saying, I'm going to impress this guy with all of the things that I know how to do. No, you're going to go into the job and say, I'm not here to change anything unless you tell me that there's something that you're not happy with. And then you sit there and shut up and wait for them to say something. If they go, no, everything's exactly the way I want it. Just maintain that. You're good. I'd sit there and wait. And then they'll go, well, you know, and then that's when it gets important. That's when you get to prove who you are. How well did you listen to what that artist said and what did you do with the information? Did they go, holy crap, it's so much better. It's exactly what I wanted, thank you. Or they go, holy crap, what did you do to my guitar? It's messed up, <laughs> okay? You don't want that one. <laughs> no, that's great. But yep. thank you, Tom, so much. I Tom really do appreciate this. It was great catching up to you. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Oh, definitely. Thank you so much. Ha enjoy your day. God bless, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, my brother. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Take care. Want more Backstage Stories? Become a member of our Patreon page. You'll get access to bonus footage, full performances, swag, and special live events where you can interact with guests. This is your Backstage Pass. What an experience. If you ever get a chance to do this, I absolutely recommend it. 100%. Hi, good. I'm looking for Marsha. Well, you got her right here. Uh, you must be Chrissy. I am Chrissy. Um, we're talking about our book. Yes. God called me to go to Africa, and I will just go to Africa to minister to the people.